All right. Happy Tuesday evening to everybody out there and welcome to our final talk in this year's uh, UC Santa Barbara Natural Reserve System Fall Virtual Seminar Series. So uh, tonight uh, we are very lucky and excited to have a presenter um, who's done some work at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory, which is one of UCSB's two reserves that are located in the Mammoth area. And so Dr. Stephen Matthews will present to us tonight and um, our director of the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory, Dr. Carol Blanchett, will provide an intro to the reserve and also to our speaker tonight. But before we get there, I wanted to just uh, open with a little bit of an introduction to the natural reserve system again um, and talk a little bit about um, some of how the flow for tonight will go and how you, our audience, can participate with us. So uh, first, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Marianne Whitman, and I'm the executive director of the UC Santa Barbara Natural Reserve System. The Natural Reserve System is an extraordinary thing that the University of California has to offer. It's a set of 41 sites, which are really field stations located across the state. And these field stations are there to, to help us learn about our natural environment by facilitating researchers, university level classes, K through 12 classes, educators, members of the public, public agencies and so on to come out into the environment and, and do what they need to do to research and learn and teach. Uh, at UC Santa Barbara, we, we oversee seven of these 41 sites and the other UC campuses also manage a handful of the sites to make the whole network. So we're excited to be able to bring to you some of the activities that, that we are able to, to facilitate and be a part of at our reserves. Um, for tonight, for your participation, I wanted to say a few things. Um, first, um, we'll start out, like I mentioned before, with um, a little presentation by Carol, who will tell us a little bit about Snarl tonight. And then after that, Stephen will tell us about his research that happens in the area of Snarl and, and near, um, near that region as well. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session, and this is where you all will get to participate with us. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little button that says Q&A, and that's where you can go ahead and go in and type your questions for either Stephen or for Carol, and we'll be sure to try to get to as many of them as we can tonight. We uh, usually kind of run out of time before the questions run out, so we'll, we'll try to cover all our bases, but um, just again, thank you for participating there. A few things about the seminar tonight. First of all, it'll be available in closed captioning. So if you'd like to see that, then just toggle that button again on the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're also going to record tonight's uh, webinar and we'll post it on the UC Santa Barbara Natural Reserve System YouTube page. And that will be live for you to see tomorrow. Um, the link for that YouTube link will also be sent to you as a follow-up in, in the email uh, that you registered for this webinar at. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Carol, and why don't you tell us a little bit about Snarl? Thank you. Great. Thanks, Marianne. I'm going to share my screen here um, just so you guys can see that. Is that good, Marianne? You can all see that? Very good. Okay. Um, so as Marin mentioned, uh, there's 41 sites in the UC Natural Reserve System, and seven of those are managed at UC Santa Barbara. Um, today, we're going to take you on a little bit of a virtual journey out to like one of the farthest sites from Santa Barbara, which lies at the heart of the um, Sierra Nevada Mountains. Okay, so this is Snarl, uh, affectionately known as Snarl, the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory. And if you were to take a road trip from Nevada to the west, you would run directly into the mountains of the Sierra Nevada range. And so the star here shows you that Snarl lies directly at the base of these mountains, uh, very much under um, Mount Morrison. And Snarl has a really interesting history. So it started out in the 1930s as a U.S. Fisheries Bureau facility. And so this is basically the Snarl campus back in the 1930s. Um, and at that time, the station was referred to as the Convict Creek Experiment Station, 
Uh, the focus of the work really was on the emerging trout fishery. And the, the focus really was on the behavior and the survival of the trout that were introduced into the Sierra in the natural streams. Um, it's pretty ironic that today, much of our research at SNARL still focuses on the ecosystem impacts of these trout introductions and the consequences for many of the native Sierran species. So if you were here in the 1940s, um, this is the entire field station <laughs> with our iconic Mount Morrison in the background. So two of the very small cabins here in the 1940s. Uh, Snarl became part of the reserve system uh, of the University of California in 1973. So for those of you doing the math, uh, next year, 2023, will be our 50th anniversary of Snarl. So here we are 80 some years later. Um, this is an aerial view of Snarl. Uh, since then, Snarl has grown to become one of the largest and most productive field stations in the UC reserve system. And for those of you familiar with Mammoth, Snarl lies on, on Convict Creek here, um, just below Convict Lake and very near to the Mammoth Yosemite Airport, just across the street here. Um, at Snarl, the Sierra Nevada Mountains are basically the backyard and the Great Basin uh, ecosystems of uh, the Eastern California and Nevada are essentially our front yard. So we like to think of Snarl as kind of a high elevation base camp for researchers working in these environments of the Sierra Nevada and the Great Basin. Um, next, I'm going to show you a really short video, two minutes that highlights um, a little bit more about Snarl. The Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory, known as SNARL, is a, is a unit in the UC Natural Reserve System administered by UCSB. SNARL is a 56 acre site, but that understates its significance. Because we're nested in an area that's almost entirely public land, we have access to millions of acres of Forest Service, National Park, wilderness. I view it as sort of a portal reserve, a stepping off point into all that area of public land. So it's, it's, a, it's a much more important, significant site than its uh, 56 acres belies. And it's one of the most heavily used and active and productive sites in the natural reserve system. Well, the UC reserve system is so important because I think what they provide are these natural outdoor laboratories. And if you go to any of the main campuses in the UC system, there are very high tech laboratories at many of these sites. Um, but a lot of times, if we want to understand what's happening out in the ecosystems where those things are happening, um, we need to have the capabilities of laboratories and facilities there where we can actually house researchers and where they can bring samples back and process them immediately. Having a facility like this in a relatively remote location really allows me to do the work that I do. After we finish a survey and we discover that a particular frog population is doing really well, within a matter of a week or two I can have a helicopter arranged through Yosemite National Park to help us move some of those frogs to a different location Without having a central base of operations like Snarl, I could never do that. Okay, um, so that was a little bit about uh, some of the work that goes on at Snarl, and uh, most of that work does happen in the summer season. However, um, as shown here, um, we are open year round, so it's not always sunny and um, pleasant year round. We get a lot of snow in the winter, which is a question often asked to us. Um, and we do support a wide variety of activities here year round. So we are essentially a base camp for several large research projects. And one of those, as you heard Roland Knapp just talking about, um, is the Mountain Lakes Research Group, which is based at Snarl. And they're Focus is really addressing some of the management challenges in aquatic ecosystems of the Sierra Nevada. And their focus is really largely um, lately on 
the conservation of the mountain yellow-legged frog, which is an endangered species. Uh, we're also home to another large research project that's just spinning up again. It's the ecology and limnology of the Mono Lake. Uh, if you're not familiar with Mona Lake, it's an ancient saline lake located uh, in the Sierra Nevada, just about 30 minutes north of Snarl. And it's home to trillions of brine shrimp, millions of birds, uh, these famous Tufa Towers, which, which it's known for, and the tributary streams, which also supply water to Los Angeles. Um, California law now has special protections for Mona Lake and uh, includes the monitoring of the health of the lake and its tributaries. And like all of the natural reserve system sites, um, our facilities here at SNARL support education, research, and public service. So we have a dormitory as well as multiple other housing facilities to support use by these university classes. And we're also home to a new NSF funded program that's expanding opportunities for students from diverse backgrounds to participate in the environmental and conservation sciences. We also know that children are our future, and so we invest in high quality educational experiences um, for those kids that are local here in the Eastern Sierra. And every day in May and early June, we have a busload of kids that come to Snarl, and they come here for grade specific lessons ranging from natural history, trees, birds, ants, uh, to activities in archeology, span as well as na Native American kinds of um, activities. And these programs oftentimes combine science and art. And we have a small education staff and a core of volunteers that really help to run these programs. Uh, every year we host over 2000 children from across both Inyo and Mono counties for these programs. And of course at Snarl, we're really passionate about connecting people of all ages to science. And so one of our signature outreach programs is our seminar series that we host every year in May at Snarl. And we provide um, an opportunity for researchers to give public talks on scientific topics of local interest. So these seminars are every Tuesday evening uh, from early May to mid-June at the Page Center at Snarl. Um, and in a normal year, um, we haven't been able to do this in person uh, in the COVID years, but we are hoping to return to this in this, in this spring in May. Um, these events are really a great way for our community to come together. And we also have facilities here uh, that are on par with a small college campus. These include a modern laboratory, housing for classes and researchers, high-speed internet, um, and one of the key uh, elements of SNARL is sustainability. And this is at the core of our mission. We have at least seven different solar arrays that meet the majority of our needs for electricity. And shown here is um, our newest facility, the Page Center, which is a state-of-the-art classroom and meeting space, um, and also the first zero net energy facility in the UC system. Uh, one of our most unique research facilities is a system of nine experimental stream channels shown here. And these channels were designed to serve as identical replicates of streams, and they're fed directly from Convict Creek. Uh, and researchers over the years have used this system for studies on stream ecology, hydrology, and fisheries. Um, another really unique facility uh, that's part of SNARL is a snow science laboratory operated in partnership with the US Army, the, the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, CRUL. And for those of you who ski at Mammoth, this facility lies near the McCoy Lodge and it transmits real-time data and images to UCSB. And we know that snow is a really critical resource for the state of California, um, as well as forming the majority of the water needs for the state. And a lot of the research at this station really supports um, these uh, state level needs for understanding more about snowpack and water. So finally, the location of Snarl is really close to many of the sites that are of great importance for the bi-state sage grouse. Uh, many of our researchers over the years have worked with Stephen and his team to monitor these populations. So today it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Stephen Matthews. He's a wildlife biologist with the US Geological Survey and he and his team have been operating out of Snarl for many years now, often in the early hours in the morning, 
to monitor populations of the bi-state sage grouse, which you will learn much more about during Stephen's talk. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Stephen. Well, thanks, Carol. Um, thanks for that uh, introduction. I'm just pulling my slides up right now. Yeah, I think that uh, everyone should be able to see my slides now. Um, but thank you again. That was a cool little intro. Um, working at Snarl, there aren't many field camps that are have um, the amenities that Snarl provides within walking distance of some birds. And so uh, later I'll be talking about our Long Valley field site. And that's literally just right off the door. Um, Stephen, I think you Snarl. need to share your slides, actually, and then we'll be able to see them. There we go. Got to hit there the share button. Yeah. Thank Looks good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, um, so I'm Stephen Matthew Sanchez. Um, I'm from a uh, postdoc with the US Geological Survey. I'll be talking about bi-state sage grouse, uh, past, present, and future. And I just want to point out that um, I currently work in the Coates Lab, and the Coates Lab is um, a, a science lab out of uh, the Western Ecological Research Center in Dixon, California. And some of the results I'll, I'll be showing to you today come from others within this lab as well, including uh, Mary Meyer Peter, Megan Milligan, uh, Karina Matthew Sanchez and Peter Coates. So if you're unfamiliar, uh, sage grouse is a large Californ bird native to Western North America. Um, it's a sagebrush obligate. So sage grouse require sagebrush for cover and food. Um, it's a lecking species. So males congregate at display areas in the, in the springtime. They perform a mating display. Females arrive and they judge the male that they want to mate with uh, based on that display. Um, and when a uh, kind of important thing about sage grouse is that they are extremely phylopatric. Um, males return to the same lex every single year, and females return to the same breeding areas every single year. Um, and this becomes a problem when, when disturbance occurs, like wildfire or anthropogenic development. Um, these birds will return to these areas even after the habitat has, has been lost, um, which makes them very difficult to recover. Um, this is a, a female-driven species. So you can see the male in the background of this photo, very showy. Um, but really it's the females which are in the foreground of this um, photo. They're much smaller, they're more cryptic, they're camouflaged. They really do all the reproduction and they really push populations forward. Sage grouse are considered to be indicators of the ecological health of sagebrush ecosystems. If you plot sagebrush, um, which is the figure on the left and you overlay that with sage grouse, which is the figure on the right, um, they, they match up really closely. Um, as we lose sagebrush, we lose sage grouse. Uh, sage grouse have been extirpated from about 46% of their historic distribution. Uh, their historic distribution is shown here in beige. Their current distribution is shown in green. Not just geographic range, but sage grouse across the range have lost about 81% of their abundance from 1966. Um, and then moving forward with the current populations that we have, uh, we're expecting at least another 12% of those, those populations to be extirpated within the next 19 years. So sage grouse have been declining across the range and they're probably going to continue to decline. This is uh, largely due to um, fragmentation and habitat loss. Um, some primary threats that sage grouse face um, across the range are conifer expansion. So these are native trees um, that can march down mountainsides and they take over sagebrush landscapes so then they prevent sagebrush from growing. Um, there's a loss of mesic habitat. Uh, this occurs in the West when um, the West is becoming hotter and drier. And so these mesic resources are becoming more limited. And then also there's a, a more development of mesic res resources and sometimes excluding birds. And, and those mesic habitats in the late summer are really important for um, chick rearing. Um, we have wildfire. And especially in the Western United States, wildfires are getting larger, they're getting more frequent, and they're getting hotter. And wildfire. Uh, removes sagebrush and kills sagebrush, and sagebrush takes between 30 and 100 years to recover following a wildfire. Um, and in that time period, uh, the landscape is now just a little too fragmented and birds don't really have anywhere to go. So a lot of times a wildfire will roll in, remove all the sagebrush, um, and then those birds just have nowhere left. Uh, and then one of the other things that I'll touch on today are uh, avian predators. So common ravens are a native predator of sage grouse. They consume sage grouse eggs. And common raven abundances are up between 100 and 1,000 percent, depending on where you are in the Western US. And that's because humans have built them a perfect landscape. We put up all these tall structures for them to nest in and telephone poles. And then we provide them with food um, and, and uh, roadkill, uh, garbage, towns, all these kinds of things. And so 
um, Raven numbers are really, really high, and they are absolutely um, lethal to sage grouse nests. So um, all of the sage grouse across the range can be uh, fit into these six broad categories of this figure. These are these categories are delineated from climate conditions. So uh, all the different colors indicate a different um, major population of sage grouse. We call these the climate clusters. Uh, by state climate cluster is also a distinct population segment. So down here in A, um, it's known as the bi-state because it's on the California-Nevada border. Um, and they are geographically isolated from other populations. So there's no longer uh, any connection to the next population over, which is in the Great Basin. Um, they're also uh, genetically unique. And because they're genetically unique, um, they've been isolated long enough that their genetics are starting to diversify. The bi-state distinct population segment is um, capable of listing on, on the endangered species list separately from the rest of the species. So this distinct population segment allows them to receive protections that other populations um, may not receive. So uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go into some of the science um, regarding uh, by state sage grouse and we're going to start in the past. Before I do, um, this is our, our the, zoomed in now on the by state and these stars are showing um, specific population clusters. Um, the snarl facility that Carol just showed us is just uh, next to this Long Valley population. Um, and we do a lot of work here. This is one of our main sites in the by state. You'll see a lot of work about the Parker Meadows population. So that's just a little bit to the north. And then um, a lot of work coming out of our Bodie Hills population. Those are the three main uh, sites that I'll show you, but we've actually collected data at all of these sites. Um, so if we look at say, uh, by state sage grouse through time, um, each one of these uh, panels shows population change from sometime in the past to now. Um, what you, the orange, yellow, and red colors indicate population contraction across time, while uh, the green and blue colors indicate population growth. And so really these bottom three panels, which are D, E, and F, um, this is from the mid 1990s to now, each panel is a, is a different time um, series. And through in recent history, we've really only seen population declines with one exception, which is in that Bodie Hills right in the middle. Um, but you can see the Long Valley population, which is um, this one here, has declined pretty substantially in all three of these, the White Mountains population, um, and the Sage Hen population, all to the south have, have declined pretty substantially in the last 25 years. Uh, biologists in the mid-1990s recognized this trend, so they uh, started a, a local area working group. Uh, this local area working group is composed of scientists, of biologists, of um, local um, industry like uh, LADWP and ranchers, um, and people from the public. And, and this group got together. They came up with the Bi-State Action Plan. This was drafted in, in 2012. And this outlined specific conservation actions that we could do to help conserve sage grouse in the Bi-State region. Um, the 2012 Action Plan had a 10-year plan. So the 10, the 10 years end in 2022, which is where we currently are. And in that time, from 2012 to now, uh, millions of dollars have been spent in conservation funds uh, and the bi-state sage grouse has been petitioned for listing on the endangered species list uh, a couple of different times. It has been petitioned for listing, and then it is um, deemed not warranted, and then it's petitioned again, deemed not warranted. Uh, most recently, it was petitioned in 2020, or it was actually it was removed from petition in 2020, and then in 2022, um, it was uh, a judge ruled that this was actually done um, this wasn't, they didn't follow correct protocols in removing by state sage grouse from uh, listing, which means they're now back up for listing on the endangered species list. So we're currently awaiting whether or not the by state sage grouse are endangered. Um, this uh, listing should come out sometime this year, we're hoping. That by state action plan that went into place in 2012 um, carried uh, many conservation projects over the last decade. Um, as it, at the USGS, we were tasked with um, performing a lot of the science for, for some of these projects. And the projects spanned from habitat um, to uh, actually moving birds across the landscape. And so um, I'm gonna get into a couple of those projects now, some of them that I've worked on. Um, but before I do, I just wanna share 
where our science comes from. So this is a, a video of a bird. It's going to take about 30 seconds. Um, it's going to show us trapping a bird. And we do that in the middle of the night by uh, shining bright lights until we find them. We find the bird, throw a net over them. Um, and then we fit radios to either their neck or their back, depending on the, uh, the type of unit, depending on the bird. Um, and then we use telemetry based on the radio to track them throughout the field season. So I'll just play that right now because it goes pretty quick. Um, there's no sound here. But this is a male. He's looking at us in the middle of the night. Oh, there's the net. So now we got him. We have a bird in hand. This is now a female. We're putting on a GPS unit. We fit this, the GPS units we fit to their rump on their back. So that's that's just on her rump. We can also put on a necklace style transmitter that goes around the neck. And then we use uh, telemetry gear in the field to track these birds throughout the year. They're extremely camouflaged. And like I mentioned before, this is a female driven species. So we're really, really interested in these females. Um, in the springtime, we perform let counts. Uh, males congregate. Uh, they perform their mating displays, and they're big and easy to see. So we can stand from a distance, um, count the number of males. And it's a good index for the population because you can count males this year. And then because they're phylopatric, we can go back next year. Uh, males re will return to the same spot, and you can count them again. And you have some idea of how the population changed. We then uh, perform telemetry in the field. Uh, this is where we track the females. Here we're trying to estimate survival and reproduction from the birds. And then we put all this together into a population model. We call this an integrated population model. It integrates three different types of data. Mainly, there's other types, but the main three types of data are light count data, survival data, and recruitment data. Uh, this allows us to estimate the population size. Once we have an estimate of population size, we can then um, estimate how that population size changes from uh, per year. This is um, just an equation that we use to calculate recruitment. So we're out there tracking the birds. What we're actually doing is we're collecting data to inform this equation. Um, I don't need to go through this, but each one of these is, is a subcomponent model. So um, nest propensity, for example, that's one sub subcomponent. Uh, this is a, uh, a binomial model uh, where either a female nests or it doesn't nest with some set probability distribution. Um, clutch size, this would be a Poisson model uh, where the expected clutch size um, has a Poisson distribution and so forth. So we're modeling every single component of uh, sage grouse reproduction. We, uh, in a figure form, I, that equation I just showed you are all of these circles right here on the left. Um, this is what uh, the math looks like in a figure form. Here's our estimate of, of reproduction, and down here is our estimate of survival. And I don't have enough time to really explain all the math here, but instead, um, you know, we're just using these things to estimate population size. Uh, and we base this on our let count data. Um, so we have some idea of how the population changes. And along as we do this, we can see how these parameters change. You know, our nest propensity, our clutch size, our nest survival, our egg hatchability, our chick survival, our juvenile survival, and our adult survival. We can track all these parameters through time. These are all governed by probability distributions. So we don't have uh, whenever we observe wildlife, you can never truly observe it perfectly. Um, instead, you get a little slice of reality. And to put all these slices together to get to build a better picture of what's actually going on out there, we use statistics and we use probability. These are the actual underlying mathematical models behind that figure, um, which I'm, I'm not going to go into these, but I just uh, I'm just showing. If anyone wants to talk about math, I would love to talk about it, um, but you might want to just send me an email later. All right, so uh, this is where our data comes from. Uh, the figure on the left, these are all the telemetry locations we have from 2012 to 2021. Um, so we're out there tracking birds on the landscape. And then on the right, this is where the active lex are that we monitor. Um, and we combine this data and the IPM to estimate population trends. Um, so here are some preliminary results on how the population is doing um, from 1995 till now. What's, what's important to understand is that sage grouse populations cycle, and you really need to capture that trend because you wouldn't want to measure a population from the top of a cycle to the bottom of a cycle, from the peak to trough. That would end up 
giving you a really negative value. Or conversely, you wouldn't want to measure from the bottom of a cycle to the very top of a cycle because you'd have really positive value. What you really want to do is measure from the bottom of one cycle to the bottom of the next. So you capture one full cycle. And that's what these three figures are. Um, these are three population cycles, from 1995 to 2001, 2001 to 2021, and 2008 to 2021. I'll start here on the left. Um, from 1995 to uh, 2021, we have an average annual population growth of 1.0. Uh, this means from 1995 till now, uh, bi-state sage grouse populations have remained stable. There's some uncertainty here between 0.88 to 1.14, but really the average annual growth is 1.0, um, and the total growth is that we've actually increased the population size by about 8.5% over the last 26 years. That's three cycles. So what's important to understand there is that in 1995, this is the lowest the population has ever been. Uh, we've never had bi-state sage grouse below this level. So even though we've had a stable population over the last 26 years, we are now back at that low level again. Um, uh, prior to this, populations were, were much higher. Over the last two cycles from two, 2021, uh, 2001, 2021, uh, over the last 20 years, we've seen an annual decline of about 2% a year. This has led from 2001 to now, this has been an overall decrease of about 27.5% of, of the bi-state population. And then this last population cycle from 2008 to 2021, we have about a 4% decline every single year. And a 4% decline over these 13 years translates to about a 40% total decrease from 2008 till now. Uh, so this really puts us in a question of, of um, you know, should sage grouse be listed in the endangered species list? If we go back in time, we're actually very stable. We're where we were from 1995, and you can see the cycle in this figure. But the recent trends have been much more negative. Um, and so this is what the Fish and Wildlife Service is, is trying to debate right now. All right, so now I'm going to move in and show you some of the uh, conservation things that we're doing to actually help conserve grouse. That's uh, how by state sage grouse are doing, and this is one of the things that we're doing to help um, conserve them. Um, this is a, a translocation project that was led by Mary Meyer Peter as part of her master's project at ISU. This project is now being taken over by Nicole Lindenauer. Uh, she's a new master's student. She'll be leading the project over the next couple of years. Um, and I have helped them uh, through both phases, and I'll continue to help them in the future. But really, um, this is uh, their master's work that I'm showing you now. Uh, we've been translocating sage grouse since at least the 1950s. Um, the problem with translocation of sage grouse is that these birds uh, have phylopatry to the areas where they were they were captured, and they want to return to those areas. So when you release them, they tend to fly away. And when they fly away, they try to go home, and in the process, they uh, often perish. Um, so just remember that. I'm going to come back to the problem of dispersal in a minute. Uh, the reason we're moving, uh, translocating sage grouse in the first place is because in one of our subpopulations here, Parker Meadows, through our IPM modeling, we found that one of those demographic parameters was extremely low. So this is egg hatchability rates. Um, once, once we have a nest on the ground and that nest survives, um, every site in the bi-state is listed up here in these box plots. They have an average egg hatchability of about 88%. So uh, every 10 eggs, nine of them hatch, about. But Parker Meadows is in the 30% range. So immediately seeing that Parker Meadows has this reduced egg hatchability compared to every other site in the bi-state, this tells us that there might be a genetic problem. Um, females are initiating nests, which means they're mating just fine, and the nests are surviving. So this isn't a predator problem, but the, the eggs are simply infertile and they're not hatching. That tells us this could be a genetic issue. So to fix this, we started translocating birds. Um, however, as I mentioned, Translocation of sage grouse is difficult because they tend to fly away. So we actually performed two different types of translocations. We did the traditional translocation, which is pre-nesting in the springtime, but then we also pioneered this brood translocation technique where we're, we're now, we let a female nest in a source population and then she hatches, and then we translocate her with all of her chicks um, because the female does not want to abandon her chicks. And so by releasing her with her chicks, uh, that's a way to keep her from, from dispersing away from our release site. Um, so we developed this uh, no, this novel method back in 2017, capture a female, 
Um, we put the chicks in a nice little cooler. We then put them in a translocation release, um, transport and release box, which we also developed. This release box has two compartments. Uh, chicks go in the front, uh, the adult female goes in the back, and there's a partition in between. And the partition is a mesh screen, like a um, screen door, so that the uh, female and the chicks can see each other, but uh, it keeps them separated because during transport, we don't want this adult female to accidentally injure her chicks if she's stressed out. We put the box on the ground. Once the female has settled down a little bit, we can remove the partition um, and allow the female and the chicks to mingle. Um, once they've fully uh, calmed down, we can open the door and the adult female has to walk through her uh, chicks to get out the door. And hopefully she brings her entire brood with her. We then put this release box, um, we surround it in a secondary enclosure pen because we found the first time we did this that the female leaves the box immediately and she leaves her chicks behind uh, because she's just so stressed out. She needs to get out of the box. She just leaves them. So we built the second pin around the box and this allows all the chicks to leave uh, the box. And then within a few minutes, once the chicks are out, we can then open the release doors, which allows both the female and all the chicks to leave at the same time. Here's a picture of a female that we translocated from Bodie Hills uh, to Parker Meadows. Um, here's her chicks leaving the box. And then uh, from a distance, we can monitor them. And so now this female and her entire brood has left the box and they're all actually in, in brood habitat in Parker Meadows foraging nicely, um, shown here on the right. We did this. Um, we went through a lot of complex modeling, which I don't have time to show you, but it, it improved um, egg hatchability rates at Parker Meadows by 179% relative to other sites in the bi-state. Um, so what we thought was the problem with uh, genetic infertility actually probably was the problem. We were, we were probably right, because as soon as we started translocating birds, egg hatchability increased by 179% relative to the other sites. Uh, in terms of population declines, uh, Parker Meadows, because of this egg hatchability problem, was nearing extinction. Uh, prior to translocation, they had a 95% probability of extinction within 10 years. Um, then during translocations, we saw um, population growth um, increase. We completely reversed those population declines. And following translocations, uh, we saw a 180% increase in population growth in Parker Meadows relative to our control sites. Um, so all the other populations in the area are accounted for. And compared to those sites, Parker Meadows increased by 180%. I really import, uh, point this out in this figure. Here, the total population of uh, Parker Meadows is declining. But then in 2017, we initiated our um, translocation program, and the population really started to climb. Uh, in 2022, not plotted here, There's a the next point is a little bit higher. All right, so that was how we're translocating birds to help restore some of the small populations in the bi-state. Um, and now I'm gonna switch topics and talk about how um, we're helping uh, other populations, specifically our, our population in Long Valley, which is one of the core populations in the bi-state. Um, and this is work, this is the master's work from Karina Matthews Sanchez. Um, Karina is actually my wife uh, at the time. Um, she was not my wife when she did this, we actually met later. She's now a PhD student at um, University of Nevada, so she's moved on but I'm gonna show you some of her work. Um, common ravens are a, a predator of several species in um, uh, Western North America that are um, threatened, including snowy plovers, California condors, greater sage grouse, uh, desert tortoises. Um, for sage grouse, they really go after nests. These are really intelligent birds. Uh, they're able to flush a female off her nest, and then they take the eggs one by one, and they consume all of the eggs. Uh, previous work has found that for sage grouse, um, you really need uh, raven densities less than 0.4 ravens per square kilometer, which is this figure on the left, um, that vertical dotted line, that's at 0.4. That gives you a sage grouse nest survival probability, which is on the Y. Uh, of a, that's a manageable sage grouse probability. Anything above 0.4 kilometers, uh, 0.4 ravens per square kilometer really starts to negatively impact sage grouse, especially at this nest survival stage. Um, across the range, over 64% of the entire range has sage grouse 
uh, has raven densities higher than this threshold, including uh, Long Valley and some areas of the bi-state. So there are some techniques managers have used in the past to help um, control ravens. There's behavioral aversion, which are scare tactics and effigies. Uh, there's lethal removal, which is culling by actively killing adults, and toxicants, which, which is a poison that kills adults. Um, and then there's also nest removal, where ravens can nest um, and you can take their nest down. There are a lot of dilemmas and ethical questions with these techniques. Um, one technique that um, we wanted to look at and it was egg oiling. So this is a non-lethal technique and um, it doesn't harm the adults. It reduces recruitment rates of the adults and it reduces the consumption um, on prey that the adults are having. This has been used in geese and it's been used in gulls to manage those populations um, elsewhere, but this has never really um, been tried on, on in an effort to conserve sage grouse um, with ravens. The way this works is you uh, find raven eggs and then you spray these eggs with um, oil. Um, this is actually from a, um, a telescoping pole, which I'll show you in just a sec. Um, and so those eggs are actually a lot larger than they look. And this is probably a foot away, maybe maybe a foot and a half. And um, the oil is non-toxic. It's either vegetable oil or mineral oil. And it clogs the pore of the egg. Um, and by clogging the pores of the egg, the egg can no longer uh, respire. So the egg stops breathing and the embryo in the egg will die. Um, so this is a way, oil these eggs, um, uh, prevent them from ever hatching. Uh, this is thought to help sage grouse because ravens are predating sage grouse eggs and to feed their young. So by preventing the young from ever hatching, the ravens um, no longer need to collect as many sage grouse eggs. Uh, we did this study at several sites across Nevada. Um, I'll just in the bi state specifically, we treated eggs in Long Valley. Uh, and we can and we have a control site nearby in Bodie Hills. Um, this uh, we also have control sites in Nevada in central Nevada and another treated site with oil in northern Nevada. Uh, so these control sites nearby, these are just sites where uh, sage grouse were monitored and we monitored ravens and we went through all of the handling techniques that would normally go into uh, oiling a raven nest, except we didn't apply oil. Instead, we applied water. Um, so it's a control to to really understand if it's the oil or if it's the fact that we're disrupting these nests. Um, at Long Valley, we actually did apply oil, and this is the site that's right outside of Snarl. Um, it's applied through this telescoping pole, which runs about 30 feet. Um, this is how we can oil raven nests on cliff faces or anthropogenic structures that we can get a pole up to, but sometimes they nest in really high structures like trees or um, structures that are uh, dangerous to climb, like this windmill. And so we also have a drone and we can fly the drone up above the nest and spray the nest with oil that way. All right, so some results from this study. Um, our control sites are shown on the left, our treatment sites are shown on the right. Um, and what I wanna point out is over here on the left. Uh, before we applied oil at our treatment sites, nest survival and the controls was 0 0.35, so 35%. After we applied the water, nest survival is 35%. So. Uh, oiling raven nests at the controls, but rather than using oil, using water, this did not affect sage grouse nest survival. It didn't affect um, raven nest survival either. We moved down to our two treatment sites prior to, uh, prior to applying oil, uh, sage grouse nest survival was 24%, so, so, so pretty low. Um, and then after applying oil, uh, sage grouse nest survival increased to 0.57. So this, we saw a more than double effect by uh, oiling raven eggs we're able to improve sage grouse nest survival by more than double. Um, this line in the figure, this is set at the median of these posterior distributions. So in the pre years before we applied oil, this line shows the, the median of this distribution and you follow it down to the after oil was applied. Um, it's basically the same. So at our control sites, uh, there was no effect of oiling on, um, with water on nest survival. But at our treatment sites, which were Long Valley and, and that other site, Northern Nevada, this entire distribution has shifted along this x-axis, which is um, sage grouse nest survival. And it, from the pre-data to the post-data, uh, we can really key in and say this was 
while accounting for time and while also accounting for space, um, uh, the oil that we applied to those raven eggs is the reason that sage grouse nest survival increased. Um, some conclusions from this study found that um, oiling raven eggs increased sage grouse nest survival. Um, the use of these treatments could have potential impacts for other predator and prey um, uh, dynamics throughout the West, not just on sage grouse, but it was, it was very effective in sage grouse. But there are also some things we need to consider before we fully go into egg oiling. Um, there are still ethical questions about this. Uh, also, it's a very expensive technique and it's um, very time consuming. So you're limited by the size of your area. If you have a huge area, are you really gonna be able to cover it? Are you gonna find every single raven nest that's out there? Are you gonna be able to oil every single raven nest? Um, and then these treatments are really effective at a local scale, but are they going to be effective at a broad scale? Can we apply egg oiling across the entire Western US? Um, these are all questions that we haven't figured out, but this, what we can, what we do know is that oiling is effective at least on a small scale. All right, and so the last part of this um, is just some of the things we're looking at in the future. Um, one of the biggest things we, we need to do um, and the foundation of a lot of this research is that um, sage, is that we need to prioritize sage grouse habitat. More than anything, animals need habitat. And so now we are moving forward into a, um, uh, to help guide managers, land managers and wildlife managers by um, mapping habitat across the bi-state. We're looking at the reproductive stages. So early broodering stage, late broodering stage, and nesting stage. Um, we're doing this to help prioritize uh, conservation efforts that cost um, tons of money. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the restoration is occurring at their correct locations and that is going to be effective. Um, so this picture here, this shows trees encroaching in sage grouse habitat. Um, we've removed those trees and now you see this picture on the right. This is a, um, a rehab landscape, so to speak, but this is very expensive. So we need to be really, really careful with where we do this. Um, and this is why we're trying to map habitat uh, in a way to help really guide these efforts. We use uh, habitat selection models. Um, we can produce cool maps like this. Um, each one of these maps shows a different life stage. So in the top left, this is nest selection. And then in the right, this is brood selection. And then the bottom left, this is late brood selection. So the really dry summer. And then this map in the lower right, this is all of them combined. Um, and in these maps, we really want these red colors. Red colors are what birds are selecting for. So now wildlife managers, land managers can look and say, hey, this is a, a compilation of, of reproductive habitat in the bi-state. And if we need to preserve habitat or enhance habitat, we can really focus on the red colors for preservation and really focus on the yellow colors for habitat improvement. Sometimes habitat does not always relate to survival. Um, you could select an area that has moderate tree cover if you're a bird because there's a moderate tree cover, but that may actually decrease your survival because raptors hang out in the trees. Uh, conversely, sometimes selection does increase survival or reproduction. Uh, a female with chicks, if she selects a wet meadow, that actually increases the survival of her chicks because that wet meadow um, provides all the uh, grasses, forbs, and insects and water that those chicks need, all the resources. And sometimes there's a mismatch. And so this is a photo from Long Valley. We found that the birds here in Long Valley are actually selecting areas right on the edge of roads. However, selecting this area on the roads is actually getting them killed. So why are birds selecting these areas on roads and what's killing them? Um, we're, we're digging into that right now. But selection does not always equal survival. That's, that's the point here is we have to be careful just because a bird selects it doesn't mean it's actually good for that bird. So we bring that idea in where we look at source sync. We're now, um, uh, I'm redirecting you to the key down here. Um, we can look at this composite figure again, which is at the bottom right, but now we wanna focus on these blue colors. These blue colors are where birds are of high selection. So they're going to select that habitat and they have high survival. Conversely, on the other end of the spectrum, these red colors are the traps. These are where birds have really high selection, but then they end up with very low survival. So if we look at this figure, which is the composite of all the reproductive life stages, the blue areas are where grouse are doing great. High selection, high survival. So if you're a wildlife manager or a land manager, protect the blue areas. These red areas are where grouse are 
attracted to. They really want to go to these areas because they have high selection, but there's something there that is really bad for them. Could be a habitat thing, could be a predator thing. But these red areas are the areas we really need to focus on management and how do we fix these red areas and get them up to these blue areas. All right, so um, some conclusions across my entire talk. Um, I hope I didn't go over on time too much. But we're currently awaiting the endangered species listing designation from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the bi-state sage grouse. Um, I have a whole other talk, which I didn't get into, but conservation actions and the millions of dollars that have gone into conservation work are actually working. Um, some acute um, conservation actions, such as translocation and raven egg oiling, have been very effective. Um, uh, broadly, habitat improvements across the bi-state have been very effective as well. Um, future work. We're, con we're going to continue with translocations in Parker Meadows, possibly translocations into other new sites. We're going to de determine the long-term utility of raven egg oiling, and we're going to try to prioritize uh, habitat in an efficient and rigorous manner. With that, this is a huge project. We've had many, many partners over many years. Um, I would just like to give a special thank you to uh, the uh, Mono Lake Committee, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, um, and Snarl. They've been very, very helpful with us um, in the bi-state area. And then all of our field technicians and all of our su support staff uh, at the USGS. Um, so with that, if I have time, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. If you want to um, pull down your slides real quick, then we'll jump into the Q&A session here. Um, that was really exciting. I, I have some questions too. There's some questions out there already. Um, before we dig into the Q&A, I just wanted to remind everybody to um, submit your, your Q&A questions for Stephen or for Carol by um, putting in, uh, uh, typing in your questions there in the Q&A box below. And um, so Stephen, I'm going to take the first question because I, because I can, I'm the MC. Um, I would like to say though, first of all, that Whenever I've been at Snarl or at any other site where the sage grouse scientists are out there, it's always so impressive because you all are going out at night and um, into the cold and into the dark to do your work. And I think that's, it looks so hard and everybody's so passionate all the time. So thank you for doing this work on behalf of the sage grouse for sure. Um, I did have a question about that though, and why, why do you need to go out at night? Um, is, is it something about the sage grouse? You know, is, is it just easier to do? Could tell us about why you're you're sampling them at night as opposed to during the day. Sure. So uh, sage grouse are prey item. They are consumed by most predators on the landscape. Because of that, they've developed these great abilities to escape. And in the daytime, they actually just see you coming and they fly away. Um, so it's really we're just limited at night. Um, we can trap them in the day at certain locations where we know they're going to congregate, but you can like shoot a rocket net over their head and drop a huge net and catch 20 birds at once. This can actually be dangerous for the birds um, because they get stressed out very easily and a bird can have a heart attack. So it's just safer for the birds to trap them in the middle of the night. And we just use a bright light. So they're just sitting they're they're sleeping or roosting, um, shine the light at them and it freezes them. They just see this giant light and then we actually play really loud music so they can't hear you approach. They just, we don't want them to hear like crunching on rocks or bushes. We just want them to hear a loud, like blaring sound. And then this light's coming at them and they don't know what's going on. Um, and if you run at them quickly, you can get a net over them before they fly. Wow, wow, sounds like a, sounds like a challenge. Um, okay. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this next question um, comes from uh, Scott Cooper. And Scott asks, are raven populations in the Great Basin increasing, decreasing, or staying stable? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure right now, but breeding bird survey from uh, dirt, breeding bird survey data from the last 20 or 30 years has them increasing dramatically um, every, almost every year. So they've been on an increasing trend, especially in the Great Basin. They're increasing more in the Great Basin than pretty much anywhere else in the Western US. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because historically, there's not a lot for them to roost on or to build nests in the Great Basin. There's, a, there's not very many trees. And this is really what they nest in. Um, so we build all these telephone poles through the middle of the Great Basin, and now the ravens are just exploding. Um, I think they may their population growth may have slowed down in recent years. 
but it is still well above historic levels. Um, I, I kind of want to tag on again another question to there too, and this is very interesting um, about the the egg oiling. And um, you know, one of our other UC Santa Barbara reserves, we have the western snowy plover, and ravens um, are certainly a predator there too. Um, do you? This this sounds like pretty new research, but. Are there any applications of egg oiling in urban environments as well? Or is this something that you, you, you all have really just explored in, in kind of the less urban um, environments? There's a couple of um, examples. One is with the uh, Canada geese and the herring gulls. I think these were done um, at parks. And I think one was done at a golf course, which is like the original whoever figured out how to do egg oiling. Um, but not really in a conservation. That was more of like the birds are pests. We're trying to control the pests. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of conservation, there's only one that I know of. Um, in the San Francisco Bay at Alcatraz Island, they had they have a pair of nesting ravens that uh, was predating pretty much every black-crowned night heron nest on the island. Um, it was one single pair that was fighting off all the other ravens, and they just knew what they were doing. So they then applied egg oiling to this pair of ravens uh, on Alcatraz. And then, which had the exact same effects, all of the um, black crowned night heron nests started to hatch, and the black crowned night heron populations really started to rebound. Um, interestingly, they found the year after they applied the oil uh, was the best year. The the ravens wouldn't come back; they they just left the area. Um, but then two years later, they would return, and then populations would start to crash again. So it did seem like it was a thing there that um, oil had to be applied every couple of years. Yeah, wow, really interesting. Um, okay, so this next question comes from Monica Solorzano, and she asks, uh, what other species live in the same general habitat areas as sage grouse, uh, other than ravens? Great, I'm, I took these slides out yesterday because I just didn't have enough time. But one thing about sage grouse conservation is that um, they're considered an a conservation umbrella. Uh, and that's because they require such large intact sagebrush communities to have a viable population of sage grouse that by protecting sage grouse, you're actually gonna protect the entire sagebrush ecosystem. And you can create this conservation umbrella that they can fit many other species under this umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, for vertebrate animals, they've identified at least 40 other species um, of mm -hmm. that, that benefit directly from conserving sage grouse. Um, there are several um, vertebrate species that are either uh, conservation concern or endangered, like the um, pygmy rabbit. Um, and then there are other species that are, are there of concern, like pronghorn antelope um, and uh, sagebrush sparrow um, and things like that, that are, that are uh, managers are concerned about, but they're using sage grouse as an umbrella to actually conserve these other species at the same time. Um, well, that's great. So. Um... Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you, Stephen, for your very, very interesting talk tonight. I learned a lot about sage grouse that I never knew before. I really appreciated your video because so few of us actually get a chance to see sage grouse uh, in action like that and also what the science around it looks like. So I, I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm sure our audience out there did too. And uh, Please keep doing what you're doing um, because we need to save the sage grouse and, and all of the habitats and the other species that are out there um, as part of the ecosystems there. So um, thank you again for tonight. Um, and I just also want to say thanks to everybody out there in the audience uh, for joining us for this year. This is our third virtual seminar series. This is the last of this season's talk. Uh, so thanks for rounding it out with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you maybe at a reserve or at our next seminar series next year. So everyone have a great, great evening and a great rest of your week. And uh, once again, my many thanks to you, Stephen, and to Carol, and um, have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.